Welcome to Stop the Echo, Political Polarization. This is a panel event which is hosted by Heterodox Academy in collaboration with Bridge USA. With everything happening in our country today, we're sure to have a very exciting and important conversation today. My name is Amna Khalid. I'm the John Stuart Mill Faculty Fellow at Heterodox Academy. As I'm sure many of you know, Heterodox Academy is a nonpartisan nonprofit group of research and teaching through promoting open inquiry, viewpoint diversity, and constructive disagreement. To quote our tagline, we believe that great minds don't always think alike. Because we are a nonpartisan group, um, I'd like to clarify at the outset that the opinions advanced today are those of our panel panelists. They don't represent the official positions of Heterodox Academy or Bridge USA. It's a pleasure tonight to be joined by four panelists, Sam Abrams, Lindsay Hoffman, Amanda Schaefer, and Trevor Lane. Each of them bring their own expertise and experience and insights to the table. So let me begin by introducing each one of them briefly. Sam Abrams is a visiting scholar at the American Enterprise Institute, where he focuses on questions of related civic and political culture and American ideologies. He is concurrently a professor of politics and social science at Sarah Lawrence College and a faculty fellow with New York University's Center for Advanced Social Science Research. Sam is the author of several books on a variety of topics, including public opinion, Congress, religion and society, and polarization. His essays have been published in the New York Times, the Washington Post, the American Interest, and the Chronicle of Higher Education. Lindsay Hoffman is on the faculty of the Department of Communications at the University of Delaware. Her research examines how citizens use internet technology to engage with politics and their communities. Lindsay holds a joint appointment in the Department of Political Science and International Relations and is the Associate Director of the Center for Political Communication. She's also the Director of the Annual National Agenda Speaker Series. Amanda Schaefer is a recent UC Berkeley graduate who serves as the Executive Director of the Bridge Institute at Bridge USA. Um, she'll be providing student perspective uh, as a recent graduate. Trevor Lane is a student studying communication and political science at Benton Community College and Oregon State University. He is the Director of Curriculum Development for Bridge USA. So before I turn to them, let me just give you a quick rundown of our plan for this evening. We'll start with a few questions that I'll pose to the panelists. And what we're hoping is that we can devote the second half of our time together tonight to questions and answers. So you can submit your questions by typing them in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. When you submit a question, it'll be received by our team behind the scenes who will elevate questions for me to ask. Uh, we have a large audience tonight, so unfortunately we won't be able to get to everyone's questions, but we will do our very best. Um, and as always, we welcome constructive disagreements, so please feel free to ask questions that are challenging as long as they're asked respectfully and in good faith. So now, without further ado, let me get the conversation going. Um, welcome all of you. Um, what I'd really like us to start with is each one of you introducing yourselves briefly and just saying why you feel so strongly about political polarization um, and why you're participating today. And for the professors on the panel, could you talk a little bit about your research and how it's related to the issue that we're discussing today and the importance of it? Sam, maybe we'll begin with you. There we go. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. It's, it's an honor to be here. Uh, I think the world of both the Heterodox Academy and Bridge USA, these are two hugely important issues or groups rather uh, that we need more than ever on our college and university campuses. Um, I've been writing about polarization for over 20 years. That's a very weird thing for me to say. And I say that because I first started writing about this stuff when I was an undergraduate uh, at Stanford uh, almost two decades ago. But um, in terms of you know, what's driving this for me, it, it's actually very, very personal. I um, grew up in a Jewish household and in my household, we argued constantly. And I went to a Jewish day school 
And one of the things about uh, my Jewish day school was that it was pluralistic. It was open to all forms of Judaism. And the big issue uh, on the table all the time was argue, express your opinion. No one takes it personally. Let's have a conversation. Let's have a dialogue. Let's have discourse. And when I was an undergraduate, uh, now almost 20 years ago, uh, and uh, I'm, I'm thrilled that Amanda is a Berkeley grad, uh, you know, I, I remember having amazing arguments with people uh, over so many different things. And I never took any of it personally. Uh, I learned from them. I hope they learned from me. And I'd go to bed really angry, but also feeling really fulfilled about it. And when I started as a professor a number of years ago, I began to feel something was a little different. I began to notice students were silencing themselves. People couldn't talk freely. People were afraid to question, uh, you know, prevailing feelings and orthodoxies on college and university campuses. And I said, you know what? This doesn't feel good. This doesn't feel right. So uh, once I had tenure, I started looking into it. That's what I study, public opinion. And I started to realize, oh my goodness, there is a growing sentiment on campus, uh, in particular among certain faculty members and administrators that basically kept saying, there are certain topics we can't talk about. There are certain things that are off limits. And by the way, if you do, you're causing harm, which I thought was a little ridiculous and a little much. So um, this is very personal because I used to write about red states and blue states. I used to write about polarization. And then I realized I have to study it and write about it in my own backyard. And uh, I don't want to dominate the conversation, obviously, but that, that's where I'm coming from. And really, uh, I found that students want to hear ideas. People want to be able to talk freely. And uh, research paper after research paper uh, that keep coming out says students are afraid to do that. And uh, I'm, again, grateful that Bridge USA and Heterodox uh, are pushing back against this to try to give faculty uh, members, administrators, and most importantly, students, uh, the tools and the support to speak back, you know, to speak up and be able to ask these questions. That's the whole point of college. And it's a, it's a wonderful experience that I had and I don't want our undergraduates to miss that. Thank you, Sam. Um, thank you, Bo Nance. Sure, um, I have a similar kind of story. Uh, I always tell my students, the reason I'm interested in political communication, which is what I study, is because my parents couldn't be more on opposite polar opposites of the ideological spectrum. My dad lives in a gated community in Florida and watches Fox News all day. My mom literally moved to Canada when George W. Bush was elected. And I think that's what drove me to understand like how can people be so divided over political issues? They're divorced, right? That's clear. Um, but I, you know, I'm a communication professor. So my goal is to help students communicate with each other. So it's become a mission over the past five or six years to give students the tools to communicate across differences and to be able to disagree without being disagreeable. Um, and so I'd say that, you know, you, you ask in your question about research, my research is actually around the topic of technology and politics and, and how people um, engage with technology to be political. But I'd say that honestly, where heterodox and where these ideas have played the biggest role is in my teaching and in my advising, because students need to know how to communicate with each other. They don't know what to say. I've had communications with students on both the left and the right um, who say, I don't know how to talk to the other side. And so my objective is really to provide them with the, the skills and the tools to communicate across those differences. Thank you, Lindsay. That's fascinating. And we'll be talking about how political polarization affects the classroom and teaching. Um, so I'm glad you're thinking about that uh, as part of our conversation today. Amanda. Hi, so thank you so much for having me today. Very excited to be here. And Lindsay, I just want to say I also grew up in a divided household. Um, and I think that that really did shape a lot of my beliefs about politics and how the political system should be working. Um, so I grew up constantly hearing like two different sides of issues. And it wasn't really taboo to talk about politics, which I really enjoyed. Similarly, at my high school and in the community I grew up in, um, I always found like that I could discuss freely um, what issues I cared about and also listen to other people. Um, even like our AP Gov teachers, they taught like one was pretty liberal and one was um, actually libertarian. And they were able to both like work together and teach like a very full um, course load for people. Um, so I found that very valuable. And then when I came to UC Berkeley, I found that that was really lacking. And I also found that the political system wasn't quite working how I had always taught, been taught that it was supposed to be working. 
Um, I saw like the lack of communication, um, both within like the electorate, but also up with elected officials, preventing a lot of actual progress on issues. And I took a lot of issue with that. Um, I think that the political system should be working a lot better than it is right now. And at the core of it, I think we just need to learn how to talk to one another again. So um, to me, discussing political polarization, I think is really important um, for the future of our common community within this country, and also for the future of um, just like our, our um, progress as a government as well. Thank you. Trevor, would you like to come in and tell us a little bit about how you see this? Yeah, um, so growing up, I, I grew up in a, a Christian home and was raised in, in that faith. And um, by, I don't think really any fault of my parents. I was a, I was a pretty closed minded kid. Um, and I was, I was very much opposed to who I perceived as the enemy. Um, fast forward many, many years. I was, that was kind of my, my childhood. Uh, I started attending Oregon State University and uh, I, I definitely felt as I entered some of those classrooms that I couldn't share everything that I really thought. And so I had a, I had a tendency to, you know, keep quiet, maybe sit in the back of the class so I wouldn't get called on except for classes where it wasn't going to get political. We weren't going to start talking about values, norms. Uh, but in the classes where we did, I, I didn't want to speak out. Um, I was also taking some classes at Limbenton Community College and uh, was taking courses from an incredible comp professor there. Um, his name's Mark. And Mark introduced me to uh, the Civil Discourse Club at LB and through that Bridge USA. And I discovered, oh, there are people who are trying to talk about these things. Uh, for me, that was that was really incredible. I'm studying communication. And what I've discovered is I, I really believe that one of the principal ways that we can learn anything, we can discover knowledge is through discourse. And when I looked at social media, when I looked at a lot of my classrooms, that wasn't really happening. People were just echoing each other. Uh, but at Bridge USA, people were not. And so I got involved there. Um, and as someone who values discourse as a, a way to find knowledge, I, uh, I think it's critically important for us to start to bridge our differences, come together so that we can collaboratively discover uh, what truth is out there. Thank you. Um... So let me start with a question to the professors first. And I, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how political polarization is informing the contours of knowledge production. So in other words, you know, what's the interplay between political polarization and the kinds of questions scholars feel like they can or can't ask in the academy? Now, I appreciate this is a really big question. And so um, if you want to like just draw on your own fields to um, reflect on the question, that'd be great. Who would you like to go first? Uh, I can go second or first, whatever is good. Okay, I'll start. Um, sure. Uh, that, <laughs> so that, that is such a broad question. We could spend all night talking about it and I'd be, be happy to do it. Um, because I wanna talk to the students and, and hear their stories and try to help uh, talk to them about how we can deal with this on campus. Um, and I want to say, not just on campus in the classroom, but in the dining halls, in their dormitories, although no one's in dormitories now, on Zoom, or some people are, on Zoom, and even at their homes with their parents, grandparents, families, whatever the, the dynamics at home, uh, political polarization is affecting, at least in the social sciences and the political sciences that I deal with, um, very, very deeply because it, it says it, two big things. The first is, what topics can someone write on or not write on? Um, I was uh, repeatedly told I can't write about certain issues of urban, you know, urbanism, even though I grew up in West Philly, even though I'm a Philadelphia native, and I'm very proud of being from West Philly, I couldn't write about certain topics dealing with socioeconomic status, race, and so on, because I was told it's just something you don't want to do, it's not a good idea. And then, you know, the very questions we ask and the starting points for where we ask, in many cases, are sadly predetermined. Um, you have to have a value-laden 
value infused set of you know set of ideas, and they guide your research. To me, that's very very scary. Um, the way I approach research, and it's gotten me into some trouble every now and then, is we go with where the data is. We go with where the narrative leads. Period. So uh, for those of you who know some of my background, uh, about 20 years ago, I, I co-authored a book called Culture War, The Myth of a Polarized America. It was one of our very first social science books about red states and blue states. And my colleagues and I made the argument that our country was not deeply divided. Uh, and we did a whole set of explanations for why that was the case. And we had an elite effect going on, but the masses were actually quite centrist and quite reasonable. And I'm unfortunately here to very publicly say that I don't believe those conclusions necessarily are true anymore. The data has changed. The landscape has changed. Uh, so, you know, I'm a believer in let's see what the data says. Let's see if we can go uh, enter a situation as dispassionately as, as possible with as little bias as possible and go with where, you know, our, again, our data or our findings lead. Uh, unfortunately, that has not become the norm. Uh, and uh, finally, and then I'll stop talking. Um, you know, there's now this sense that political scientists need to be public intellectuals, uh, first and foremost. They need to blog. They have to have an agenda when they come in. This is very, very dangerous. When I started uh, this, the idea of being a publicly facing scholar was shushed, was frowned upon and even shunned uh, because you brought in bias. The idea was, we're scholars. Let's figure this out. Now, it's first and foremost, you're a scholar activist or you're an activist and then a scholar. Um, there are virtues to that and there are values to that. And I don't, I don't want to suggest that they're not. Uh, but at the same time, that colors one's lens and that colors the research. And I think uh, it can lead to some dangerous findings and uh, some incorrect findings where we overlook the truth. Thanks, Sam. I think you bring up a really important point about, you know, there may be merits to merging activism in your scholarship, but there are real dangers over there as well. Um, Lindsay, would you like to tell us a little bit about your research or how you see the questions in your field being shaped? by political polarization? Yeah, well, um, I'm very familiar with uh, what Sam was talking about from a public intellectual perspective, um, kind of the struggle with how you present yourself. Um, I'd like to, I think it was great he talked about the research aspect of things, but again, I feel like a lot of my work around these issues have been with teaching and advising. So I'd like to address that for a moment. Um, the day after the election in 2016, um, and I'm at a pretty liberal campus. The University of Delaware is East Coast, relatively liberal. Students coming from Long Island, New Jersey, and, and Philadelphia um, for Sam. Uh, but um, they were kind of befuddled about what happened on the election. So the after, on the day after the election, I felt like I needed to go in and talk to them about sort of what are the phil philosophical and, um, you know, real ramifications of what this election outcome was. And I was kind of shocked that several political science students came up to me afterwards and said, I've had three political science classes today and you're the first professor to talk about the election. And they said, my other professors said, don't ask me about it. I don't want to talk about it. It's very upsetting. And I found that really disturbing because I feel like it's our obligation to talk to our students about important civic issues. I mean, when I walked in that classroom and I saw, I had 50 students, I saw 100 eyeballs turn towards me, like, explain this. <laughs> you know, it felt like I, I had to do it. So I was really kind of bothered by that. And I know that students seem, seem to be bothered by professors who share their views openly in the classroom um, because there's a power imbalance there. And you know they might feel like they cannot speak out. Um, I had a, I'll, I'll tell a quick anecdote if I can. Um, I had a student who came to me at the beginning of the semester in a class that I teach um, where I use the righteous mind as a, a course uh, textbook. And um, she, my daughter's looking in. Can you go back to your room, honey? Thank you. I can bring mine in if you'd like, no problem. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I had a student meet with me on office hours and she said, I'm conservative and not even my best friend knows this. And she was in her first semester of her senior year. Um, and I said, okay, we're gonna figure this out. We're gonna help you learn how to talk to people and be open. So this was 2017. And if you recall, we had two of the worst mass shootings in 2017 in the fall in uh, Las Vegas and in a church 
at tech in Texas. And by this point, she'd already started wearing her NRA hat, um, was being very open about, well, relatively open, wasn't very subtle. Um, and to be honest, I'm, I'm actually not a fan of the NRA. So like for me, like I, but I put that aside, like that doesn't matter to me. I want her to be able to express herself so she can hear different viewpoints. So on the day after the Texas shooting, she said, she emailed me and said, can I announce in class today a meeting for the students for Second Amendment rights? And I was kind of like, today, like today you want to do that? And then I said, yes, absolutely. Um, let do that. And then I went to Living Room Conversations, which is another great resource. And I looked at their uh, gun rights, uh, gun discussion page. And the very first question is, what was your first experience with guns? It's not about what's your position on guns? What is your, um, you know, what do you think about people who don't agree with you about guns? It was, what was your first experience? It's about humanizing um, people's experiences. And so several students said things like, oh, I went, learned how to shoot a rifle at camp, or I, you know, learned how to go shoot a gun when I went hunting with my friend's dad. And it just so happened that that semester I had a, um, a Ghanaian refugee who had come to the United States when she was 12 years old. And she kind of calmly raised her hand and said, I don't understand any of this that you're talking about. I, I, I can't see guns as anything other than killing people. I don't see it. I don't, I can't understand your, your framework. And so over the course of that semester, I saw my NRA student talking to that student. And she came to me at the end of the semester and was very grateful, said, thank you. I feel like I can talk about my positions now. Um, and about a month later, I was listening to NPR and they were like, we're at the University of Delaware talking to students about guns and gun rights. And here we are interviewing and they named my student who was the one who said, I can't even tell my best friend that I'm conservative. And she went on record with her full name and where she was from. And I continued to keep in touch with her, um, you know, Four, three years later, uh, she's very involved in kind of this conversation around, let's talk with people across differences. And I have so many stories like that to demonstrate that students want this. They, they, they yearn for this. They, they just need an avenue and a platform. And I'm gonna plug my speaker series, um, National Agenda. If you look up udel.edu uh, slash CPC, um, we have a program that we offer every fall that's about looking at um, differences. So that's one anecdote that I'll share as a teacher um, in addition to the research that people like Sam are doing. May I respond real fast to that? Sure. But I don't wanna talk over everybody else. Uh, number one, please invite me to UDEL. I would be honored to do it once COVID is over. That would be so much fun. Um, any excuse to go home or near home is, is, is welcome. And obviously I presume there's a Wawa nearby, so I'll be happy. Um, secondly, um, you, you said something uh, at, the, at the beginning of your remarks and, and your anecdote, I have hundreds of similar anecdotes. So thank you for sharing that. Um, and, and something that bothered me, and I, I wanted to mention this, and is that you know a lot of your colleagues refused to talk about what happened uh, after the 2016 election. Uh, and um, you know, I, I can't speak to Delaware enough because I don't know it well enough, but I, I can confidently say that at Carleton or Amna as a professor and, and at Sarah Lawrence, that would never happen. And one of the reasons I remain a professor at Sarah Lawrence, because a lot of people say, oh, well, you do a lot of research. Why do you want to just teach? And I say all the time, because there's nothing more fulfilling and meaningful than actually talking with people in a very real way. And I love the fact that as a professor, and I think everyone on this Zoom understands this, we like that dialectic, we like the dialogue, we want to have this engagement with our students because that's how we have real viewpoint diversity. If we're in the classroom stepping up, we can do a lot of that. Now I'm gonna take a quick pot shot at, at UC Berkeley. They don't have a whole lot of that there. I have been to Berkeley, I have actually spent a significant amount of time there. And yes, there are some classes, and some opportunities to do that, no question. But I also have plenty of horror stories uh, from my own uh, friends who've been there where the classes are huge. And you just sit there and you don't know each other. So you can't have these dialogues. You can't have these debates. And one or two people make a stink in the classroom and things get shut down immediately. So, you know, it, it frustrates me that many schools are so focused on the publication aspect, but not the teaching. Publisher parish, certainly there's some value to that, but there's also incredible value to teaching. We are first and foremost 
teachers. Uh, and, you know, I, I, I blame us as faculty, very bluntly, not, not you, of course, uh, you know, Lindsay, but a, a lot of us for ceding a lot of the teaching ground to people who aren't teachers, uh, to administrators and so on. We should be the ones leading the dialogue because we are trained to see things, or at least used to be trained to see things from multiple perspectives. And, and that's changing. It's our sacred role, our sacred duty. Uh, and I think, Amna, you probably feel the same way, even if we disagree. Um, up until recently, my students didn't know anything about my politics. Now they're out and I tell them, but that hasn't stopped anyone from talking to me. We're just more candid about it. Thank you, Sam. I mean, that resonates so much with my experience as well on campus um, and what Lindsay, you said also in terms of, I will have students who will come to my office hours and say, they didn't want to say something in class, but they'll share it with me. And then it's it's my job, and I see it as my job, to try and facilitate that conversation within the classroom. But I have found it, um, even at Carlton, where we are, we try to be a lot more open, it, it gets harder and harder, and not so much because of my position, but because of the kinds of attitudes and opinions and beliefs that students are bringing into the classroom. So I want to take this moment to pivot to Amanda and Trevor. And you know, how, how for you do you see political polarization uh, affecting your relationships on campus? And, and then, connect that to what you see playing out in the classroom and how comfortable are students really voicing their opinions about controversial issues and conversing about them. So Amanda, maybe we'll begin with you. Yeah, so Sam, you mentioned UC Berkeley and I think Berkeley is a really good example of the fact that students don't really feel comfortable sharing their opinions in classrooms unless they agree with the vast majority of students there. Um, I know that Personally, I consider myself more of a progressive pragmatic, um, where I agree with a lot of the ideals and I'd like to see a lot of the things that activists at Berkeley are pushing, but I don't necessarily agree with the means. And even though I agree with a lot of their values, I would still feel uncomfortable speaking up in some classrooms. And there are just like, it almost depends on like the, the different department and then also um, kind of like the topic of the class. Um, so it did definitely vary, um, but, I definitely know in some classroom discussions um, that were, I don't know, very dominated by like an, a Berkeley activist um, kind of persona, I didn't feel comfortable speaking up, um, which really isn't fun when you're trying to explore how to actually solve the issues that um, like they care about. So I found that personally very frustrating. Um, that also wasn't the case in other classes though, even within the political science department. Um, I imagine, um, much like every, like the professors on this call, um, I had some classes where the, pro the professors were very open um, at the beginning, like this is what I believe, but don't let that like control this at all. I'm leaving my partisanship at the door, as should you. We're here to talk about trends. We're here to talk about strategy, not partisanship. Um, and I found that very, very valuable. And I think that more campuses and more professors really need to adopt that mentality because that's where like the productive discourse comes and we're never going to be able to make progress as a country and as a higher education institution if we don't allow like more free discourse. Um, so that's why I'm very glad that I'm a part of this conversation that heterodox exists and also that Bridge USA exists because I found that a lot of like my value um, and a lot of how I discovered my political beliefs was through Bridge USA and being able to openly explore ideas with students who are similar, similarly open-minded. So I think that exploration is vital to the college experience. Trevor, as someone who's uh, currently a student, um, what is your experience and how do you speak to this question? Mm -hmm. um, starting, starting with relationships, um, that, there's a, from the social science side of communication, there's a, a theory of how we manage relationships called uncertainty reduction theory. Basically the story goes, uh, when you meet someone new, you're doing everything to try and figure out where they're at. And you don't wanna reveal your, your cards. You're, you're playing it pretty close to the chest at first because you're, you're trying to establish that connection. Um, as a person who is conservative at Oregon State, which is a, a pretty progressive institution, um, I, I feel that. And when I meet people, I'm definitely playing my cards closer to my chest. And uh, it, because there's a 
very strong chance that I'm going to disagree with the person across from me. Um, and that was my that was my experience in the dorms, um, which we do we do still have those Sam um, and people are living there. Uh, whether or not that's the right choice is, is yet to be seen. Uh, but I, I experienced that in the dorms. Uh, I experienced that in my classrooms. I was very fortunate to have an incredible communication professor who was, she was honestly um, very upfront. She's not going to leave her opinions at the door. She's going to be honest with us. She's going to be transparent. Um, but she encouraged us to do the same. Um, and you know, the, the conversations that we were having in, in classes I, I took with her didn't often stray into something that was too controversial, but I, I felt very free to challenge my students and sometimes to challenge my professor um, if I had the opportunity. And um, she is one of the, the greatest professors I've ever had because she fostered that atmosphere of dialogue and learning through discussion. Um, and that has been kind of a unique experience at OSU. On the whole, a lot of my classes, I, I feel that learning is dampened by a, a concern, uh, a concern about stepping on other people's toes. Uh, this hasn't always been promulgated by the professors, um, but I also am feeling that from, from my peers. A little bit. There is very much a, you know, we're, we're all online right now. And so our discussions are not happening face to face, but uh, on the keyboard. Uh, and I, I do sense a, a, a hesitancy to challenge other students. And so I guess I've taken it upon myself to be somewhat contrarian at, at points and challenge trying to challenge other people to foster good discussion. And I found that that helps um, in in those learning environments. On the whole though, that is not particularly present uh, at Oregon State at least. And Trevor, it's, it's such a delight to have a student in the classroom who plays that role. And I, I really, really appreciate the courage it takes to, to actually embody that role and play devil's advocate. Um, I'm going to push you a little further, Amanda and Trevor, and ask a question that might come across as a little provocative, which is, you know, there's plenty that's been said about your generation and um, how it's been formed and how your opinions are formed. Well, to what extent do you believe that your generation is contributing to the polarizing that we're seeing today in our society? So this might be a bit of a hot take or to say, um, but I think that our generation is almost just victim to the system that we were born into. Um, polarization started way before we were born, like decades before we were born in about the 1970s. And we've never known a political system that wasn't broken by polarization and it's only gotten worse, but not necessarily because of us. Um, Gen Z, this is the first election that many of us can actually vote in. Um, I don't think that our generation should really be at fault for what's happening. And I think the combination of polarization starting kind of with a concerted Republican attempt to rebrand their party and make it more appealing, um, that's kind of what started pushing their party a little bit further and further and further. The Democrats have since really responded and also kind of pushed further and further and further. And I think that young people kind of got caught up in this, these systems that were already at work um, not anything that we could have really controlled. Um, and I think that in combination with like the parties already moving, plus the technology boom that happened when we were, I don't know, like 10 or so, um, we've just grown up in this highly polarized system. Um, parties polarized technology and social media really exacerbating that, sorting us into these social media bubbles where you can't hear from people who don't agree with you. Um, and I really don't think that our generation can be at fault, but I do think that we've exacerbated things. And I think that we've created a lot of intergenerational kind of warfare um, where like older people kind of look at us and say, oh, all these like young people, they have no idea what they're talking about. Like we can't have the things that they're demanding. Um, and I think that that has kind of increased polarization as well, where the left um, young people have been a little bit further uh, 
they've been pushing the envelope a little bit more, which creates a backlash. And then it's just like this interpartisan, intergenerational warfare that's been going on. Right, so I'm gonna, uh, before I turn to you, Trevor, um, I think Sam would like to respond over here so we can have an intergenerational dialogue. <laughs> So I've um, been teaching classes on polarization now for 10 years. So I don't completely agree with the narrative um, that, you're, that you have. And let me just say two quick things about it. The first, um, I'm going to recommend Julian Zelizer's book, Burning Down the House. He is a liberal historian. I work at a conservative think tank, but he wrote a great book. And I wish you were on this. Uh, it's recorded. I'll make sure he, he knows that I'm plugging this book. It is a great book. And I don't think polarization really started in the 70s. I really think it started in the 90s and it was an elite effect. Um, if anyone wants to email me, I will Zoom with you all night to explain that. Now is not the best time. But um, I wanna give your generation a heck of a lot more credit than you did, just did. Um, I've spent an awful lot of time studying them, um, working with them. Uh, I feel like an old fart because I'm 40 and have Simpsons quotes, which don't land very well anymore with, with, with Gen Zers because no one watches it in, in Gen Z. But if you go to my webpage at AI.org, you'll see at least 10, 15 articles about Gen Z. And the way I see it is Gen Zers are the most open. They're the most curious. They're the least um, ideological and the most dynamic. And I actually blame social media for that because the idea of one or two clear truths does not exist. It is a messy, chaotic, steady stream of, in of input of, of, of you know, in many cases, overwhelming digital material. So you have to be selective. You have to figure out how you want to marry different ideas together, how you want to merge different thoughts together. And um, I hope I'm right because um, it means that our future is brighter than I think. I think our older generations are, are, are polarized. I think the boomers are very polarized. Uh, the silence are even more polarized. And um, now some of the Gen Xers, those of us who are bitter in our 40s and 50s are, are that way. But millennials, a little bit, but not so much. Gen Zers, um, I wrote a piece last week in the dispatch, check it out. Uh, where I'm hoping that the numbers are right because you're the hope here because you're not and you're open and um, you're not at fault obviously for inheriting this mess but I think you're our great hope collectively to fix it so I'll stop talking but um, anyone on the you know on, on this call wants to talk more about it uh, when I don't have my little one around I am happy to uh, talk all night about it. Can I just briefly say thank you so much for giving us the hope um, I don't know about Trevor, but sometimes I feel like the prevailing narrative about young people is that we don't know what we're talking about. Um, and so I personally don't feel, I personally feel like we know what we're talking about. And I'm glad that you share that hope for our generation. You do. You do. You have to let people who are older s stop silencing you. you. I mean, it's ridiculous. You do. And you should be represented on the stage. And the fact that if you look at presidential candidates, we are going backward by going older and older rather than younger than younger, you know there's something a little off with that. Well, and if I can add, uh, the Walton Please. Family Foundation just released today a key report about um, Generation Z and millennials and um, about how opt optimistic they are about their future. So I encourage you guys to look into that as well. Yeah, I just want to say I'm especially heartened when I read about stories where, you know, it is the Gen Z that kind of resists and pushes back towards older students and say, you know, no, we want to have an open dialogue and we won't stand for classes being shut down and shouted down. So I do think we need to give you guys credit and you should take it. Trevor, what are your thoughts? Yeah, a few things. Um, Sam, you, you mentioned the dispatch and I just have to say that they are my favorite uh, news outlet right now. Um, and so I'll, I'll have to I'll look for that article you wrote. Um, and Amanda, I, I definitely feel that. Uh, I often feel like I'm being looked down on a little bit by older folks. And generally my response is to try and uh, barrage them, flood them with big vocab words from uh, the communication or political science discipline. Um, but I, I, I think that does not always endear me uh, to folks. <laughs> um, but yeah, as a as the, the latest of millennials, um, I think I do think that we have some responsibility in this. I mean, I mean, everyone has some responsibility in this. That's the that's the point of this society in which we live. And I, I am also really optimistic. I guess I am included in that that study. Um, I'm represented. I feel represented by that. Um, but it's not optimism that can just 
sit as optimism. Um, I am optimistic because I do see in uh, my peers and uh, those I see coming after me that um, that we're optimistic, but we're willing to act and we're willing to have these conversations. Uh, even if it sometimes doesn't feel that way in the classroom, every, almost every single time I've talked with someone face to face about controversial issues, it's gone really well. And um, yeah, I, I think we, we have responsibility and that responsibility is to take what we've been given and transform it uh, to make for ourselves a better future. Thanks, Trevor. Um, this is a hopeful note. Um, I'm going to ask one more question. Actually, I'm going to direct it to you, Lindsay. Um, do you think that the correlated mapping of liberal to Democrat and conservative to Republican still holds today um, in our present political culture? Or do we really need new terminology to think about positions across the political spectrum? I think that's such a fascinating question. Um, it just so happened that I interviewed um, Steve Schmidt, who uh, has been a leader in the um, Lincoln Project, which is kind of an anti-Trump anti -Trump Republican initiative. Um, and uh, just this week as part of uh, my speaker series. And I went back to that um, series before we talked tonight because I wanted to go back over what he said. And um, he said that Schmidt uh, or Schmidt said that um, he feels that a lot of the polarization right now, and I, I agree with Sam that it started in the 90s, but it's root, Schmidt said it's rooted in Vietnam and that, that George Trump is equal to a Wallace, George Wallace presidency. So that has a lot of connotations to it. Um, but let's remember Steve Schmidt ran McCain's campaign, was part of the George W. Bush White House. Um, and I just, if I can read a quick quote from uh, that conversation we had, he said, there's going to be a huge allergy in this country. Trump's not going away ever. Trumpism is now a thing. So I think in regard to your question, we have a third party that is Trumpism. He said, it's a rooted ideology. It's authoritarian-ish, it's illiberal, it assaults the rule of law, it's corrupt, it's much closer to Orban of Hungary or Erdogan of Turkey um, autocracy than it is to any central right government. And he gave this really interesting analogy that he said, it's like a white star astronomically as it's collapsing. He says it gets smaller, denser and hotter and political parties are doing the same. They're getting smaller and denser and hotter, which means they're getting more and more extreme. And I think what young people need to understand is that the more and more extreme voters are the ones that vote in primaries, which give us the candidates that we end up with in the general election. So I think it's a fascinating question. And I just wanted to throw that out there um, just because I just happened to have interviewed him last week. Um, but yeah, I think we're, we're in the reckoning for looking at where our parties are at and what, whether that's a good system or not. That's great, Lindsay. And actually, I think, you know, so much of our conversation actually focuses on the US alone, and we are part of a broader shift and trend that's going on. And at another time, maybe another day, we can host a conversation about global trends. Trevor, would you, I know you want to respond to that. So do you want to come in for a minute? Yeah, um, well, I'm going to start by saying I'm kind of an old man at heart, sitting sitting on my my porch yelling at, yelling at the kids. Um, and the, the conservative liberal dichotomy just really bothers me. I do not like it. Um, Russell Kirk uh, talked about liberal conservatives and I personally identify in that way. I'm a conservative. I think that uh, the best way to preserve and progress society is through the foundation of institutions that we have. But the, the tell us of those institutions of that that setup, if you will, is to preserve liberty fundamentally. And so I, I kind of use liberal in the um, modern philosophical sense. Um, and uh, Stephen Stephen Schmidt he looks at Trumpism and he sees this populist uh, more open to authoritarian movement. And honestly, I see that on either end of this political spectrum uh, on the more conservative side and the progressive side as well. When it comes down to it, 
there are liberals in the Republican Party and there are liberals in the Democrat Party. Uh, Democratic Party. There are conservatives on either side uh, as well. Uh, I, I really don't think that those those terms are helping us, and we need to develop a better taxonomy, a better way to frame these, and probably a more complicated way to talk about it and uh, represent people accurately. On that note, I'm going to take the first audience question, which actually is drawing on that dichotomy. So here it goes. It's kind of long, so let me read it out. From the right, there are accusations that the left is becoming illiberal. Liberals no longer stand for freedom of speech, and they want to tear down the institutions that allow us to change our country peacefully. From the left, there are accusations that the right is anti-equality. Conservatives are either actively or passively supporting nativism, racism, and white supremacy, and they're letting this happen really for their own political gain. Do you believe this is true, partially true, or largely wrong? Now, I am going to give one of our panelists the chance to respond to this question. Who wants to go? Well, I mean, I'll just say very briefly, I think Sam is probably the better person to talk about this, but I mean, um, if you look at Pew Research Center's research over the past few decades, it's undeniable that Republicans and Democrats and liberals and conservatives have become further and further and further apart. And um, I think that it's, it's damaging because we are listening to two different conversations. There's two different levels of conversations occurring among people who are on the left and people who are on the right, and they're not interacting at all. And it has a lot to do with our media environment. Um, so as a communication scholar, uh, it has a lot to do with cable news and the polarization of cable news, but I'm gonna let Sam take over. Sure, uh, that is a great question. Uh, but again, one of these questions that I could teach a whole course on. So I, I, it, it, it's hard for me to even figure out how to answer that. Um, you know, there, there, you know I, I'd like to recommend, and I just pulled it up here, uh, there's a nonprofit called More in Common, and they have a good book, a good report out called Hidden Tribes, the Study of America's Polarized Landscape. And they actually do this where they go out of their way to try to think uh, about how to characterize uh, Americans outside of a just liberal conservative uh, two-part dichotomy. Uh, Pew is certainly aware of it. And I want to be clear that political scientists are very, very aware of it. Uh, for political purposes, though, we often tr have to say, are you a Democrat or a Republican? But we all realize that that is, a, in many cases, a false dichotomy or an untrue dichotomy. We also see that there's been an enormous rise in dependent identifiers. Uh, you know, I, I don't know how much more to say about that, only because, it, again, it could take an hour to go through all of this. But... Um, you know, I, I think everybody in the policy world and in the academic world uh, and, and the press realizes that this is this false dichotomy. Uh, and that in many respects though, um, this dichotomy is driven by two small elite extremist groups, uh, you know, on the left and the right that don't necessarily represent most of Americans. My uh, first book on this basically made that argument that you have a set of true believers, the people who think that there's this culture war, but most Americans are more concerned with putting food on the table, having families at home, uh, watching TV, although that's old, people don't watch TV the same way anymore. But the, the idea is simply that I think that, it, that it's, it's not the case that most people are extreme in that regard, uh, but now they're forced into two choices and the world is more complex than that. So I think that uh, people in communications and in political science, sociology, even econ, we're trying to figure that out. We're trying to figure out another way to think about it. But for the time being, we still have a two party system in this country. So we have to use that term when we think about politics, but obviously it's more complex. But uh, take a look at the Hidden Tribes report and Pew. I think they both do a very nice job trying to look at this more, more carefully. But again, email me uh, and I'm happy to talk about this offline. Well, this actually connects very nicely to another question that's come in, which is, you know, all of you, the panelists are talking about what happens when you already have political convictions? What about people who don't have their minds made up and who are trying to figure out what views they should have? How do you recommend navigating that? Can we leave that to the students? I'd like to hear their yes, I have a lot to say, but please, I don't want to talk over the students. Yeah, I think it's important to note that many college students fall in like the most impressionable years while they're at their universities or community colleges. 
um, this is where the vast majority of their brains kind of like start finalizing. It's where they're able to like figure out where, what their worldview is and what they want to do. Um, and I think that that psychological piece is important to keep in mind because um, that makes like the, the value of discourse in the classroom that much more important where these are very malleable minds and you have to be able to not just put them into a mold, but let them figure out their own mold. Um, but in terms of where you should go to actually like figure out what you believe, I think surrounding yourself by as many viewpoints as possible is really important. Joining clubs like Bridge USA um, can accomplish that and starting club or starting a chapter of Bridge USA if your college doesn't already have one. Um, that's a really good starting point for college students. Also reading, <laughs> like reading, it's hard these days. Um, many of us are technology addicted, but I think that reading a lot and reading beyond just what your teachers assign you in the classroom is really important. Um, and listening to and absorbing as many ideas as possible. Yeah, I, I think I would, I would start a little lower um, and say, look at, look at what's going on around you. Um, whether that is, you know, the, the national environment or a more local environment, look at your family, look at yourself and how you live your life and think about, take some time to, uh, it's some time for introspection and think about what you believe is right and start trying to come to conclusions. Once you have an idea of what you think is right, what your values are, then go talk to people about that and engage in discussion with others. Try and find people with whom you disagree and explore their ideas and where they're starting from and how that leads to their conclusions. And those experiences, uh, thinking about your, your lived experience, thinking about your upbringing and um, what you observe in the world. And honestly, how that makes you feel in your gut. Uh, do you have a gut reaction to something someone says or does? Um, and then exploring those. I think that is the, the place to begin and to start to lay a foundation of where you're gonna go. And I would just say it's, it's okay if you don't come down on some extreme philosophical position um, that is a hundred percent always like this, this perfect, consistent, logical train. Um, it's okay to land somewhere and then explore why. Sam, I know you're itching to say something, so go on. <laughs> uh, many, many, many things to say. I mean, to me, higher education, the classroom is where we should be having those explorations and in the dormitories late night. Uh, and that's why I've been uh, writing so much about, you know, the, the creep of administrators who are, and, and administrative staff who are telling us what we can and can't talk about, who are mediating and moderating things. They shouldn't be there. Uh, we need to toughen up. Uh, and, and, you know, uh, uh, Haidt and off talk quite a bit about that. We need to stop being coddled and stop being so offended by these things. I tell my students, uh, you need to read the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times every morning. Um, I say, you need to look at Twitter, but stay off of it to a degree because it's dangerous. Stay off of Facebook because it's also dangerous. It's not absolutely horrible, but you know, take a look at op-eds in papers and on sites that you wouldn't normally read. Uh, and when this horrible COVID thing is over, travel. And I don't mean you have to have a lot of money to travel. I wanna be very clear about this. This is not some socioeconomic thing where someone's going to attack me and say, that's privilege. No, yes, obviously it's great to go visit Germany and see how things work over in Germany or Britain or whatever. But if you uh, are, are secular, or atheist, agnostic, anything like that, go to a church. There are churches everywhere. Um, go to a synagogue, go to a mosque, doesn't matter. Go visit and talk to people unlike you. You'd be amazed at how quick um, you can find common ground with them. You would be amazed how quickly you realize these are not the evil people you might think they are. They just see things a little differently from you. I've spent a lot of time uh, writing about rural America and you realize that to Trevor's point, um, and this is why I still think that um, the polarization argument that there's people on the extremes but most people are still reasonable in the middle is, you know, if we cut down those labels, open our minds and hearts, and I actually mean open our minds and hearts and listen and hear it, um, you'll find some evil. You will definitely find some weird stuff you would rather not see. Uh, this is where I would normally swear. Uh, but you will also find some fabulous stuff and some of the most kind, uh, thoughtful, open people. And, you know, look, I I'm... Um, 
I'm very proudly Jewish and I like what that means. But let me just tell you something. I, I, I disagree very much with certain uh, tenets of, of, of Christianity. No, no issue there. But when I meet people who believe like that, they're the greatest people ever because we just say, look, we just don't agree on that. But we agree on all these other values. Let's work together and toward it. There's no animosity. It's okay. I don't believe in that thing. You don't believe in this thing of mine. Cool. No problem. Well, if I can just good. jump in, Sam. Um, I, I interviewed a, a Dre McKesson, who is a Black Lives Matter activist um, in 2015. And I just reposted this today because I had just posted it on Facebook, like that Facebook memory thing you get. Yep. And he said, our ideas can be in conflict without us being in conflict. And um, I just, I, I completely agree with you that like we can have differences of viewpoint, but it just takes practice. I think that's what our students need is just like practicing having these conversations and having conversations that go, go the distance that they haven't really been willing to go to before and realize, oh, this wasn't actually that hard. All we had to do was kind of just tip the balance a little bit, just go over that edge a little bit and be like, okay. Um, and then I want to say one final thing. I know you want to wrap up, I'm not sure, but um, I want to say that um, one of the things that Dre McKesson also mentioned to me in 2015 that has really been resonant for me for you know years since then is um, when a white student asked him, how can I be a part of Black Lives Matter? How can I be a part of this movement? He said, use your privilege to disrupt the privilege. And that anecdote, that little phrase to me has been, has been so meaningful ever since then. And I feel like, you know, each of us has privileges in our own ways and we can use that to say, all right, let's shake this thing up. Let's have conversations that maybe we wouldn't have otherwise. So that's kind of my final parting thoughts. <laughs> I am not eager to wrap up at all, Lindsay. I can talk about this stuff all night too. So um, actually I, I'd like to take a couple more questions because I think we are having a fascinating conversation. And to Sam's point about, you know, the conversations that happened in the dining hall and in the dorm rooms, I mean, that's where I think my education really took shape. Classrooms were of course informative and, and I learned a lot, but really where I honed my opinions and sharpened them were in conversations with my peers um, in non-classroom settings. And, and it does irk me, as it does you, that we have ceded that ground to administrators to uh, dictate um, what the norms of those conversations should be. And perhaps it is for students today and our hopeful Gen Z to push back against that and reclaim that space. Now, this brings me to another interesting question. There are two actually, but they're interconnected. So one's from Donald and the other is from Quinn. So Donald's asking, um, what role do you think identity politics plays in heightening polarization? Um, and do you think we can transcend these labels to find common humanities, uh, humanity? And then Quinn is saying, um, you know, what's a good way of navigating situations when you're, when you're told um, either that you could never understand or that you just won't get it and that experience is exclusive to the individual speaking. So, um, especially when considering contentious topics like racism, sexism, etc. So really, this, I think, is an important issue of our times. How is the identity politics mapping onto or not the political landscape? Amanda, do you want to step in? I feel like you haven't spoken for a while and you might have something to say here. Yeah, um, I think identity politics have been really big in like the polarization that we've been seeing. Um, there's this sorting aspect that's taken place within the parties. And granted, we were talking about earlier, there are all these contours within those parties. And I think that those do still stand as well as like the sorting of the parties, both along racial and gender and age lines. Um, so I think that it, it has been a really big driver of political polarization. And I think too, that it does make conversations difficult. And like, as a white woman, like I'm trying to personally like make space for people of other races to discuss um, like their experiences. And we've been seeing this summer, like a huge movement where you do want to like engage in conversations, but you also have to take a step back. Like the, the quote that you said earlier, where it's like, you don't want to like talk on something if you're white. Um, I think that you do, like you wanna cede that space to someone to help inform your own views. 
um, instead of just coming in from your perspective and sharing that. Would anyone else like to respond to that? Um, I, I can, I, I think from a communication perspective, it's very much about, you know, and I use Jonathan Haidt's work a lot in uh, my teaching and my mentoring to students. It's about opening up yourself to the other person as a human being and finding your commonalities as human beings before you engage in any debate. So you're not gonna be able to pers persuade anyone to do anything unless you have connected on a uh, more human level. So I feel like um, I'm also involved in this uh, organization that I found actually through the um, Heterodox Academy conference last summer, um, Free Intelligent Conversation is a great organization. Here, I'll show you a sign if it works. Oh, it doesn't work. Okay. Oh, no. <laughs> Either way, before we were all offline, online, um, we would stand around our college campus and hold up these signs to say free intelligent conversation. Trevor knows what I'm talking about. Um, and we would just ask questions of people that were intelligent conversations. Like if you had the world's attention for 20 minutes or 10 minutes, what would you say? And it's amazing how you can connect with a, another human being who, a stranger who you don't even know just by having these conversations. So I'd love if Trevor could kind of talk on that as a student perspective as well. Yeah, I mean, imagine if students from a small community college in Oregon met up virtually with a class from the University of Delaware all the way on the other side of the country and had a really productive conversation that had really good conversations, built empathy with other people. We did that, we did that last spring. Um, the, a class I was helping out, um, the, the same con professor Mark um, at LB uh, with last academic year, we, we connected with a class that Lindsay was teaching. And we, we brought people from geographically, um, I, I don't know that I can say what the landscape is like in Delaware, but uh, regionally, LB, Lynn, Lynn Benton counties and Delaware are certainly very different uh, and very different communities. Well, and a lot of our students come from Long Island and New Jersey, um, you know, very urban areas. So it was really, really fun. I think one of the best examples that I, I found in that interaction, and I encourage people to look up free intelligent conversation if they want to replicate this, is uh, one of the questions was, what's something new you've learned in the past year? And I dropped into this breakout room and a student was doing a magic trick with cards <laughs> that, you know, he was like, I learned how to do magic. <laughs> and it's like, sometimes we just, we need that. We need that kind of connection. We need to focus less on our divisions and our politics. And we just need to focus on how we are as human beings and how we can connect with each other. And when we, we start doing that, we start connecting with each other, we can begin to imagine walking a mile in their shoes, um, as cliched as it is. But when we can do that, we can start to come together and really hash out these big uh, ideological value, political differences that we have and come to solutions that it may be that they could meet our, all of our interests. We can find outcomes that we all desire and we can work to achieve those, uh, even if our values are different. And if I could just add one little thing, um, even though it sometimes feels like it is, it's not radical to talk to someone that you disagree with. Um, like that's where a lot of productivity and a lot of like just discourse happens. And I think it's really important to remember that. And like you will find that you have common ground with someone somewhere. Great, thank you. I also want to, um, it's a good moment for me to remind everyone that um, Heterodox Academy also has communities and we have HX um, undergraduate community, uh, community as well, which you can, it's a Facebook group and you can join that through our website where you will be able to have some of these conversations across campuses with other undergraduates. So do check it out. 
Um, one last question. There are lots of very good questions, but I think uh, we will have to wrap up and this will be the last question. It's more of a practical question and maybe Lindsay, you can talk about this. Um, and Sam, you too is, you know, do you teach your students some communication skills for having productive conversations on these charged topics? Um, people want to know, like, they're curious to hear some examples and practical tools that they can use. Absolutely. Um, and I do workshops, not just with my classes, but with other student groups on campus, like fraternity and sorority leaders. Um, we have something called, the, our mascot is the Blue Hen. So Blue Hen uh, Leadership Initiative. And I provide them with very practical skills, which is, you know, how to approach the other side. One thing is, you know, I, one thing I really respect about you is X. And I'm, cons I'm interested in what your opinion is on this topic that we're talking about. And also being willing to say, you know what, I'm wrong. You know, I was wrong on that issue. Being willing to say, yeah, I did not know the thing that you're talking about. So it's really about um, an intellectual humility, about a connection as human beings. And it's about practice. That's the most important thing that I instill in them is that you need to practice this. You need to engage in these conversations with numerous different kinds of people and be able to step away if you're like, you know what, this is a little difficult. I'm not sure we're going to agree on this. Let's table this for now, but let's come back to it at a time when we were able to talk about it. So there are some very um, uh, concrete skills that, that you can teach students and I'll, I'll hand it over to Sam. Thanks. Uh, so let me make two quick points. Um, the first is that this pandemic, COVID-19, it sucks. Uh, I was in uh, Manhattan uh, when it broke. Uh, you know, it was crazy for, for weeks on end. But uh, one of the things I'm trying to do with COVID is find some of the silver linings. And here's one of them, believe it or not. Uh, it's a weird segue, but it's true. There have been some very nice things that have emerged. Uh, and one of them is that I have been able to invite guests into my room and room, virtual classroom, who I normally would have a lot of trouble uh, bringing uh, to the classroom, either finding a time or the money to bring them onto campus and so on. So I'm able to bring speakers in who my students may not traditionally hear from or views that they may not traditionally get. Um, also, I want to point out, we're all fairly comfortable now on Zoom and doing this sort of approach. So to Trevor's point and, and Lindsay's point, there, it is now, there is very little difficulty. It is very easy now for us to reach uh, people around the country, if not around the globe. So if we want to talk to people with different views, let's just call them and get them to talk to us. Uh, and that's our jobs as, as faculty, even administrators and students. If students have friends who are a little different, let's do it. Uh, you know, at Sarah Lawrence College, uh, it tends to be a progressive urban uh, type of undergraduate. So, you know, I was able to connect them with folks who went to a rural liberal arts school. It's easy. It's, in fact, in most cases, free. Uh, and and that, that's something that I like. Um, also, in terms of some practical skills, uh, I think everything Lindsay is doing is phenomenal. Um, one thing to add uh, that I'm trying to do, uh, in my syllabus, I make it very clear in every syllabus, here's who you're going to read, and here is their general bias, uh, where they come from, what their position is. I want you to know what it is, and I make sure, or at least I do the best I can to make sure, that if we're gonna have a policy-based conversation, I present at least two different views on that. And I make it clear who the authors are and where they're coming from. I also insist that the students break up into small groups and present the work that they don't want to present. Now, to be fair as a teacher, that's annoying. I know that if I'm presenting and leading the conversation, I know what I wanna do, I know where it's gonna go. I'm, I know the work in most cases better than the students only because I'm older and I taught a little more often. So I'm comfortable because I'm sort of in control, I'm in the driver's seat. And it's a little angsty sometimes handing it over to students who've only encountered this for the first time and who hope the conversation goes well. Truth be told, I've now been doing this for about six years. It's only gone wrong once or twice in about six years. Oh, we're not wrong, but it's gone off the rails once or twice in the last six years or so. And I make them read and present work that's not their own because it's exactly what we talked about, the importance of walking a mile in another person's shoe, seeing a world from their, you know, another person's viewpoint. Uh, you know, we can try to do debates. Debates are great. They don't always work very well with undergraduates, but having a chance to present an argument from a perspective they don't like and present why it works, why it doesn't, and what we should talk about to take from it often works very, very nicely to get viewpoint diversity across and in the classroom. 
Uh, so that's just something I do. Um, I think uh, what Lindsay is doing is, is phenomenal. And again, the silver lining of COVID is we're now comfortable talking to each other in these little squares, which means we should keep it up. And it means that, you know, instead of having a room of folks who've never been to church or to a mosque or to a synagogue, cool, let's get some people there. Let's get some people in and let's talk to them. Uh, will you occasionally run into something inappropriate, a little crazy, a little extreme? Absolutely. But I think you'll find what I described earlier, which is a lot of love, a lot of heart, and a lot of common ground. Thank you, Sam. I, I just want to say, like, I've also found that strategy very useful in class. And sometimes I make students take positions they absolutely abhor. And at the end of it, they're like, actually, I kind of got wedded to that position. And I'm like, hmm, interesting. Uh, think about what it is that makes you latch on to a particular point of view. And that kind of leads to broader discussions or deeper discussions about assumptions we make. Amanda, do you want to talk a little bit about the work that Bridge USA does in this respect and how these conversations are facilitated? Yeah, definitely. So in the classroom, it's definitely important to be facilitating these dialogues and Lindsay and Sam shared some really great ideas. Um, but at Bridge USA, we also think it's important to take those conversations out of the classroom as well, because um, that's really where a great learning experience is. And at Bridge USA, our whole thing is that we, we facilitate tough conversations about politics and bring together diverse points of view. And um, we always start all of our discussions with our discussion norms, which are listen to listen rather than to respond, don't interrupt other people, um, address the statement, not the person, and understand that participants are representatives of only themselves and not of their social groups. And I think that reminding people of these four kind of basic norms, like they're basically just respecting other people um, is really important. And that's how we frame all of our discussions. And Lindsay brought up the importance of practicing having like these difficult conversations with someone that you disagree with. Um, I think that's one of the most important things that you should be doing. It's learning to practice that. And by engaging in uh, these discussions at Bridge USA, um, I, I know that I found it, I'm sure that Trevor has as well, um, as our other students, that going to a discussion once a week, um, slowly the bridge mentality starts to leach into other conversations that you have with people that you disagree with. And it's really a remarkable thing. It's like a full mind shift change. Um, and like I said earlier, it's not radical to talk to someone that you disagree with. Like it's important to explore different values and you're not compromising your own values by disagreeing with someone. This is music to our ears as professors to hear students talk like this and to be so open. And I really, really appreciate that you stress that people are speaking for themselves and not their groups. I think that helps us get away from this identity politics, which can make conversations really quite flat and unproductive. Um, so like I said, I've really, really enjoyed having this conversation and I would like to keep having it, but in the interest of time, um, I'm going to have to wrap up. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, it's been wonderful. And to our audience, I want to say if you've enjoyed tonight's event, um, you might be interested in joining Heterodox Academy and Bridge USA. I encourage you to check out our websites and be in touch um, either with the panelists or us or through our websites. Um, to members of Heterodox Academy, you know, keep your eyes peeled for our bulletin and for new events that we are planning. As Sam pointed out with one of the things, the silver linings of COVID is that now we can have many more of these conversations with people uh, from across the country and the globe. So we are taking advantage of that and trying to facilitate more conversations. Um, our big next event is on October 22nd, which is a Thursday. It'll be a conversation with Professor Jonathan Zimmerman about his forthcoming book on the history of college teaching in America. I think that'll be a really productive and um, insightful conversation. So you're all invited to um, register at our website. And finally, thank you again so much. And I really want to kind of thank our panelists for taking the time um, in the evening when we have children to put to bed uh, and, and being willing to have this conversation. So thank you and have a good night. <laughs>